almost a full three months since we were last racing in the European Le Mans series in 2023. We finally arrive on the uh, Côte d'Azur here at Le Castellet in the south of France. What, a short drive away from Marseille or from Nice, depending on which is your destination. If you've flown into this part of the world, some of you, I'm sure, are lucky enough to be based in the south of France and uh, ha perhaps have chosen tomorrow to actually visit the venue to experience the European Le Mans series up close. But yes, 16th of July or 15th today, and we're only about to start round two of a six race season. We know the reasons for it because Imola scheduled in May could not take place because of various paddock and pit lane upgrades taking place. A lot of these cars were able to make use of the Le Mans 24 hours, of course, last year as guest entries in addition to the regular World Endurance Championship races, but Le Mans 24 does not form part of the European Le Mans series itself. So we're going to be cram cramming in uh, five races in the latter stages of the 2023 season. And Graham Goodwin at DailySportsCar.com, together with me, Johnny Palmer, will be with you every step of the way. There's certainly not a moment to lose, Graham, and a quick turnaround between some of these races. Absolutely. It's an endurance race and not a sprint, though, at the end of this season. Uh, but with two uh, races to come, of course, at the season finale at Portimao, and that's going to make for a grandstand finish. Before that, though, we get into 15 minutes of qualifying per class in this three-class European Le Mans series Grid, 42 cars. Remember, though, this year it's four separate sessions because the Pro-Am Pro -Am gets an additional 15 minutes. So, yes, it's going to be well over an hour's worth of qualifying with the sort of five minutes or so of downtime between each. I had forgotten that after the 80 days or something since we first ran it at Barcelona. The other thing we can say now with the WC's Monza race now in the history books is five more opportunities to see these fabulous GTE cars in yes. Europe. This is the last season for GTE, and this is the last place in Europe you will see them in the European Le Mans series. The mixed grid here of Ferrari 488 GTEs, the Porsche 911 RSRs and the Aston Martin AML Vantage GTE cars. We just caught a glimpse of the number 16 Proton competition car for Ryan Hardwick, Zachary Robichon and Alessio Picariello. That's the trio that lead the championship on 25 points. 50 car of Formula Racing, which does have a driver change this weekend. So it is Johnny and Conrad Lawson, but joined by a certain Ferrari factory driver from the 499P, Nicholas Nielsen, guesting for Mikkel Mack. Correct. But he's not eligible for this qualifying session because it's bronze only, and all of these cars must have at least one bronze. They do. Your second choice of driver come the race can be silver or bronze, and everyone's gone with a silver, and then your final choice is entirely free. So there are a handful of platinums and elsewhere filled in with gold drivers, but the likes of Johnny Adam, Richard Leitz, Matteo Cairoli, Nicholas Nielsen has mentioned, and Nicky Team will all be competing in the race and most likely in the closing stint to uh, the finish point yesterday, uh, sorry, sorry, tomorrow, I should say, at 3.30 tomorrow. Yeah, quick look at the GMB Motorsport car. They'll be home for better luck than they had to turn two at Barcelona in their opening race with that car. They had similar bad luck getting caught up in someone else's accident at uh, Le Mans. It's going to be the Kessel Racing 57, the car guy livery car that uh, leads the cars out. Quick look there at the number 72 TF Sport car. Uh, reverts to its full season colours after the Pescarolo tribute livery it ran at the Centenary Le Mans. 93 car, it will be Michael Fassbender aboard this car in what we understand to be the last of his five-year programme with Porsche. We'll find out, I'm sure, later this year what Michael intends to do about uh, keeping his driving career going. But this programme will be done after Portimao. And that's an intriguing one for me, Johnny. Portimao is home circuit. Mm. He's always been good there, and he gets two races to expand on that. Could we see Michael Fassbender finish this season very much on the up? And the plan there, is that to run the... The, effectively the race that had been postponed from Imola, Imola on the Friday. Correct. And then there's a Sunday race, Correct. as was always scheduled. So, yeah, a busy one, but at least it's not two four-hour races in sequential days. You do get the Saturday off. As there, the 93 car with Michael Fassbender will really have to wait for his route out of pit road. 
didn't cut across the bows of anybody else, but the problem now is that he's uh, many cars back and will have to work to find some clean air. Good as well to see the 66 car from Job W here at Inrood Health after getting absolutely battered at Le Mans. Uh, came uh, across two cars effectively stationary in the middle of the road across a blind crest and uh, hit both of them. One of them was the Kalu Kobayashi driven Dota and there are fears that this venerable old lady of a Ferrari Ford Ferrari take that has contested every single uh, European Le Mans series race and every single Le Mans 24 hours since 2017 might be in trouble but here she is it's the second of the yellow cars there we want the car with the the black highlights on the the bonnet that is the 66 car of JMW Motorsport so who's out there Ryan Hardwick is in the number 16 Proton Competition Porsche Dorian Pan in the uh, Iron Links garage supporting the Iron Dames or the Iron Links cars guys rather uh, Jens Muller is in the GMB Motorsport 44 Aston Martin the Formula Racing number 50 is Johnny Larson, the father of the father and son of the Larsons. Crichton and Tudis from Greece is in the 51 Air Corsa car. That's the one with the Greek flag adorning its bonnet. Duncan Cameron is very familiar. Uh, British Racing Green, Spirit of Race 55 Ferrari. Kessel Racing's Takeshi Kimura is in the 57 Car Guy livery car. The 60 Iron Lynx Porsche in the hands of Claudio Scurvoni. Martin Berry is aboard the JMW Motorsport number 66 and the 72 TF Sport Aston Martin Arnold Robin. Christian Reed in the black and gold 77 Proton Porsche, the 93 Proton Competition Porsche, Michael Fassbender as we mentioned, and uh, Christian Reed pits immediately as does Fassbender. John Hartshorn completes the field in the 95, the red TF Sport Aston Martin, Johnny. You're talking about histories of GTE cars and the 66, also worthy of note, which I learned after a really informative and lengthy conversation with Chris Gregory yesterday, who's the chief mechanic at TF Sport. The 95 Aston Martin, which is being driven by John Hartshorn, that is known at TF as the super sub, because it was the car that got stuck in a two-hour queue of the Eurotunnel to replace the massively damaged treble seven D station car at Le Mans this year in the FP1 practice shunt at Forest S's coming out of there. So they had to source a new car to run as the treble seven in the 24 hours of Le Mans. That is the 95 car this weekend. It also was the replacement for Enrique Chavez's crash at Monza last year when they had to source a new... Remember, he rolled that he at the second chicane. Had to go to Fuji. They had to get a super sub car for Fuji and beyond and Bahrain too. That was the 95 car this weekend. So it is a real trusty bit of uh, vantage, that car. It is. Really, um, you know, well at home with the team. They love that particular car, and it's in the hands of John Hartson, Ben Tuck, and Johnny Adam this weekend. So the leading pack on now to their first attempt at a flying lap, just 15 minutes in this session, of course. Doesn't give much room for error. All three of the Proton cars, 16, 77 and 93, opting to switch tyres by the look of it at the end of that uh, first lap. But Takeshi Kimura, it was, that was first out of the blocks and he's coming through now to complete his first flying lap. So we'll see what the marker time is going to be. 57 comes through now and that time will pop up as a 158.134 for the Japanese driver. So over the line will go Kimura. Here's the GMB Motorsport Aston Martin, driven by Jans Moller, who is the bronze again in the 44 crew. Don't forget as well that the 16 Porsche in this session and in tomorrow's race will have to carry an extra 30 kilos of success ballast for not only winning the previous race, but also because of that, topping the championship as well. So there are only three cars carrying success ballast this weekend. The 16, the 50 Formula Racing Ferrari, and the Martin Berry, Lorcan Hannafin, John Lancaster car as well. So that car with only, what is it, 15, it's five times two, so only 10 kilos to worry about in the third place car in the championship. More times coming through, Graham. They are indeed. Still Takeshi Kimura tops the times and goes purple in the next sector as well. Excuse me. Yeah, so the gap's only, well, the gap is nine tenths of a second with a further two seconds back to Johnny Lawson, but 
similar to if you were out around for the Michelin Le Mans Cup qualifying earlier on today, because this is an all bronze session, cars will be out for as much of the 15 minutes as possible because they'll be getting quicker and quicker. That is the nature of non-pro drivers as they get more used to the car, they get more confident as well about where they can find a bit of time. Those times will continue to be chiselled away at and a 158.1 is not where we're going to stop. It most certainly isn't. Just about everybody is on a, a lap that is purple against that time. The one outlier is going to be Martin Berry whose time will not count this time around for track limits in sector one. We wait, of course, for the three Porsches to give us their first shot at this, but 158.134 it is. As we see, Takeshi Kimura come round, he will take a chunk out of this. So 158.134 becomes 156.974. Two seconds to the good, it won't stay that for long. An absolute best at the start and at the end for Takeshi Kimura in the Kessel Racing prepared car guy Ferrari, Johnny Lawson, even though that car's got a bit of extra weight, 20 extra kilos for Formula Racing, but he's now hustled his way to the top of the shop. Number 50 car with Nicholas Nielsen as part of the lineup this weekend. We're on board with that car now. The glorious 3.9 litre turbocharged, twin turbocharged V8. That's the other thing that is going to change as yep. well with the engine notes of these cars and a very highly developed GTE engine compared to the GT3 power plant. Indeed, we'll switch next year to the GT3 cars and Ferrari's chosen weapon will be the 296 GT3 with turbocharged V6 engine. So 156.8, Duncan Cameron comes through, 156.6 for the number 55 Ferrari. He'll be pleased with that. A couple of laps under investigation for the 44 car. GMB Motorsport currently set fifth, but I've got uh, two laps under investigation now. So Cameron, Lawson, Kimura, Ferrari one, two, three, before we get to the first. Aston Martin, it's Arnold Rabin, who's on a quick lap now. He's uh, currently just under seven tenths off provisional pole pace. So we get into the second half of the uh, the session, Michael Fassbender goes ahead of Robin and is uh, up into fourth, quickest of the Porsches at this stage. Remember, at Barcelona, it was uh, Martin Berry, the driver in the 66 Ferrari, after uh, that horrible accident at Le Mans that happened subsequently, but it was Martin Berry who took pole position at Barcelona at the start of the year. So an extra point for that. They arrive here at Le Castellet, therefore only four points adrift of the Lawson and Mikkel Mack Ferrari, although Nicholas Nielsen this weekend has mentioned. So the gap at the sharp end, though, is seven points. 25 plays 18 between the 16 Porsche and the number 50 Ferrari. Duncan Cameron remains top. They're all circulating well, fairly evenly spread. And there are going to be another set of tires thrown at the GMB Motorsport uh, Aston Martin. They think they can do better here. And they're currently sitting sixth. Christian Reed, by the way, on a quick lap time at the moment that looks uh, set to put him. Close to on over top. Arno Rabin goes top. It's an Aston Martin. Pole position at the moment, six minutes to go. 156, 598, 71 thousandths to the good from Duncan Cameron. But he's think he's lost that lap. Mm. No, he's not. He's not lost it. It's just that Duncan Cameron's gone through and improved. 156, 435, 0.16 of a second to the good. So Ferrari, Aston Martin, two more Ferraris and Porsche. Is top five. Looking for where Christian Reed is going to emerge here. He's on a quick lap here and he's going to trouble professional pole. Ryan Hardwick goes third as we wait to Reed goes to the top. In the black Porsche for Proton Competition. It's the flat six you can hear in the background. Mid engine Porsche, remember, in GTE, soon as well to be a thing of the past. Meanwhile, the silver fronted number 93 car, third with the three amber lights illuminated just in front of the rear wheel arches of Michael Fassbender's car. So he's just gone up to third. 
I wouldn't be surprised if a few more come in for perhaps more tyres, although they are running short of time. They are. Only it's... because tyres in GTE and oh. ELMS absolutely unlimited, so you can use as many as you want during qualifying. That was a squirmy moment for Christian Reed. I think there was uh, an off-track moment that surely must have been track limits, but at the moment, that early stop for Proton paying off all three cars in the top five. It's Christian Reed from Duncan Cameron, that gap, 0.175 of a second. Michael Fassbender, what is that, 20, 42 thousandths of a second back from Duncan Cameron, on of a bar, three tenths off Reed, four and a half tenths off Reed is Ryan Hardwick. So the top five cars separated by under half a second at the moment. The other big difference in this category compared to the LMP3s and the LMP2s is that Goodyear have been allowed to develop two different compounds of slick tyre for the GTEs, so presumably a medium and a hard. You'd stick mediums on day in, day out for the qualifying session, but you might want a bit of durability during the longer stints in the race. Christian Reed is quickest by just under a tenth and a half over Duncan Cameron's Spirit of Race Ferrari. Another Porsche from the same Proton Competition team in third position in the hands of Michael Fassbender. But Arnold Robin already has a pole position to his name today in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. And the 72 car looking to try and improve for TF Sport. It was a quicker lap time, but no improvement in place for Duncan Cameron last time around. So he's still 0.147 of a second off Christian Reed. Extends his gap to Michael Fassbender just by a few hundredths of a second. Ryan Hardwick improving in the third Proton competition car. That is in the sky blue colours. And the 16 car leading the championship, just creeping up to fifth position now. Yep, and closes the gap to the leader again under four tenths now. Takes about half a tenth out of his best. Yeah, so the car run by Proton Competition, but looking very much like a right motorsports car. If you follow the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, it's because Ryan Hardwick runs with uh, Wright Motorsports in the US and has adopted the same livery in the 16. Johnny Lawson in the 50 Formula Racing car, only good enough for sixth place as we speak. But one thing I'm noting in the top five is there's only one Ferrari, and that is the 55 of Duncan Cameron for Spirit of Race. No, it's one, two, three at the start of this session. Duncan Cameron will not improve this time around. It's a track limits in the middle sector. Honor Robin puts in the fastest third sector of the session, but stays fourth. Yeah. Very good final sector, though, there. And uh, can Jens Muller, in a similar car, but from a different team, also manage a good final sector? He hasn't got a flying lap to his name yet. Hopefully that will be rectified now with this newer set of tyres. And on the newer set of tyres, he will go sixth in the 44 GMB Motorsport to Aston Martin. So that looks to have been a good move from the Danish squad. Here comes Ryan Hardwick, about to complete another lap. And he's finding time here, there. And everywhere, but not on that lap, so stays fifth in the 16. Yep. Top six now within four tenths of each other. So for the tenth and a half to the seventh place, Johnny Lawson, who led this session earlier, you'll remember, as did Takeshi Kimura. He's now eighth. Down with the brakes for the 50 driver, then Johnny Lawson, and it's now working his way through this. Long, lingering right-hander into Virage du Lac, where you've got to hustle the car over to the left-hand side of the circuit. There's the pit lane entry road over to the right, but staying the correct side of the blend line there. Down to probably second gear for a really tight right-hander at turn 14, and back across the line. And there is improvement for Johnny Lawson, all done in the final sector, down to a 156.5, takes him fourth. It does indeed. Top seven now, four tenths separation really really close 156 260 30 seconds left before we see the checkered flag 31.3 degrees air temperature it's a tenth and a half the gap that this man Christian Reed has got from Duncan Cameron in the front row is then what is that it's seven hundredths a second to Michael Fassbender Christian. further nine hundredths to Johnny Lawson 
Christian Ring was fully off the road between the two Bose corners there, so I can imagine that this lap will be counted out, although we don't have the, the amber disc with the T and the L in the middle of it on our timing screen to indicate that that was a track limits infringement. This will be his last lap, by the way. Checkered yeah. flag is out. Yeah, so if he does manage to improve, but at the moment the splits don't suggest he will, then uh, this lap could well be deleted. But Christian Reid about to cross the line now. 156.8, hangs on to pole position, and that is the crucial thing. He didn't need to improve, and it's in his back pocket, I would think. It's Johnny Lawson is the one to watch. He had a stellar third sector last time around. Michael Fassbender has completed his run. He'd be no better than third. And third is a darn good uh, shot from the 93 Porsche man. What can Johnny Larson do in the last sector here? He is... 3.314 seconds off the pole position. I think the first sector for Johnny is just a bit too much. It's a 33.8. Christian Reed on the lap where he didn't improve was two seconds, two, uh, two tenths of a second quicker than that through the first split. Christian Reed was done for track limits as yeah. I suggested. No through improvement Bose. for Johnny Larson. Yeah. No improvement. A, a couple of hundreds out. And you're right. It was that first sector that did the damage. Duncan Cameron doesn't look like he's going to make an impact there either. It's an improvement, by the way, from Martin Berry right at the end there. John Hartshorn actually uh, picked up a couple of places in the late running too. He did. Yep, leapfrogging at Crichton, Len Dudis and Claudio Schiavone for AF Corsa and Iron Lynx respectively in a Ferrari and a Porsche. So we're still waiting for three cars to head across the line, but none of their sector times suggesting that they'll be able to whittle away at the times they've already produced. So nevertheless, a good qualifying for Duncan Cameron to start on effectively the front row of GTE and miss out on pole position by 0.147 of a second. Lentudis and Schiavone now cross the line as well. Neither one of those cars improved. So it's a first pole position of the season for the 77 Porsche, and it makes it a different manufacturer as well because it was Ferrari top in Barcelona. Indeed, Christian Reed would have enjoyed his team leading the race at Monza just last weekend, in their first race in the FRWC's hypercar class, and he will head away the field. There is the result. The classification in GT, Johnny. 156.260 for Christian Reed in the 77 Proton competition, all black Porsche. And as I say, by just under a tenth and a half quicker than the 55 Duncan Cameron driven Spirit of Race Ferrari. Then the second Proton competition car of Michael Fassbender with the silver front. Uh, he will start from third place in class ahead of Johnny Lawson, second in the championship, fourth on the road tomorrow for the 50 Formula Racing car. 72 TF Sport and Arnold Robin fifth. Proton Competition's Ryan Hardwick in the 16 Porsche, sixth. GMB Motorsports Aston Martin Jens Moller in seventh, ahead of Kessel Racing 57 Ferrari. The JMW Motorsport Ferrari 66 will start from ninth. And the second TF Sport Aston Martin will be ahead of Crichton Lentudis and his fellow uh, co-drivers in the 51A of course of Ferrari and Iron Lynx will be at the rear of a 42 car field in the number 60 car for Claudio Schiavone. So that is one quarter of the qualifying done and dusted and we will look forward to LMP3 qualifying again for 15 minutes very shortly indeed. Yeah, this uh, quick fire qualifying format, it, it sort of sometimes leaves you wanting a bit more but uh, does dole out the drama. They've got to get it done, they've got to get it done quickly. There is no real room for mistakes. So Proton to competition will be delighted, I'm sure, with that. They've been such a big part of the history in GTE. Announcement came at Le Mans that uh, in LMGT3, they'll be making the switch, at least in the um, FI World Endurance Championship to the new Ford Mustang GT3. The common link there with their other programs is Multimatic. Yes. Screen's clear here, and we now have our screens with 12 LMP3 cars on it. A final word on Christian Reid. He did get a pole position last year as well. That was at the Monza round of the European Le Mans series. 
Monza was hastily rearranged from, Hung well, I say hastily, Hungaro Ring was originally on the bill for 2022, but that didn't happen, so we had two trips to Italy. No bad thing at all in my book. And yes, the second of those gleaned a pole position for Christian Reid, his only one of the 2022 season. So it's been a bit of a wait, possibly a full year for another one to come around here at Le Castellet. Indeed. Still, by the way, Mr. Ever present in the FI World Endurance Championship. I've no doubt that will continue to the end of this season. And then we'll hear from Christian about what he plans to do. Could always jump into that Porsche 963. The problem is there's no bronzes allowed in hypercar, Indeed. but uh, I'm, I'm sure he'd fancy a go. Might have, sure. even, <coughs> might have even had a go on the quiet. Graham, Graham may, may know the secrets at uh, Proton Competition. Uh, unlikely. They didn't get the car until race week, so there's no testing uh, this side of it. That car, by the way, from Monza, now en route to the United States. And there will be another new 963 for the team for the next round of the WC in Fuji. So they will expand to two hybrid cars at that point. One in North America and one for the Global World Championship. Great to see families out here in the blistering conditions. Unsurprisingly, not very many people with the uncovered grandstands. So as teams go to work. My first chance to see the number 13 into Europe World Competition car with its new look driving squad for 2023. And one of two decays in this 12 car lineup. This is the W10 by Rinaldi Racing squad. Torsten Kratz, Oscar Tenio, and it is Oscar at the wheel. Your vice. Yeah, so uh, some real names to conjure with in this championship. And uh, again, very tricky. We always say this particularly about LMP3. Very tricky to pick out who might take pole position, unless it's the 2022 season. And it was just Malta Jakobsen, Malta Jakobsen, oh yes, and Malta Jakobsen. Whereas this time around, it could be much even, more evenly spread pole sitter. This is the number seven Nielsen racing car you'd have seen across the nose of the car. Tony Wells and Ryan Harper Ellum for Vinny. And uh, we mark as they do with sorrow, passing of a very loyal crew member back all the way back into radical racing days for the squad based in Corby in the UK. And uh, after a fight with uh, not very nice illness for Vinny, unfortunately, it, it didn't go his way. They are man down and very sorry to be so. So to his family and his friends, and they are, they are legion around the motorsport paddocks, we mourn his loss, and they are marking that on the nose of all their cars here this weekend. Lovely touch, that. And yes, uh, thoughts with everybody affected, of course. So Leo Weiss sharing with uh, Oscar Tugno in the number 12 WTM Wockenspiegel Team Monschau uh, by Rinaldi LMP3 car. It's going to be Mama Espirito Santo aboard the number 18 Virage car. They had a great day so far, haven't they? With Johnny, we've been calling the Ligier European Series races already today. Double win for the Team Virage squad. What can they do here? So Marcos, Marcos Siebert took the pole position at Barcelona all those months ago. He's uh, 27 years old of Argentina and actually back for a, a second year in the European Le Mans series. He didn't compete for the whole season last year. Did did this round at Paul Ricard, tellingly, and also Imola before stepping away because uh, he had a fairly busy season elsewhere. But uh, doing a bit of international GT Open racing this year together with, hopefully for him, the full season of European Le Mans series. Ultimate, the family crew from France, uh, back to their roots, if you like. They've run in LMP2 in recent years, but running again in LMP3 for Eric Chouillet and Mathieu and Jean-Baptiste Le Hay. Absolutely. After a year in the WEC with their friend Francois Ario. Francois is across and racing in the United States this year. Jean-Baptiste and Mathieu Le Hay with their new co-driver and back into LMP3. Eric Chouillet and this uh, ultimate team being run with assistance from Graf Racing this year. 
So definitely the number 17 cool racing car will be one to watch, thinking about what happened at Barcelona. But there was only three tenths of a second in it to the number 13 into Europol competition car uh, at Barca. So who will have done that time? It was Wyatt Brikacek yeah. who ran fastest in the number 13 car and only missed out on the, on the pole by a couple of tenths. So we haven't got official starting drivers yet and some of them are actually giving us a bomb steer on the timing screen but all will become clear when they are unleashed over the timing loop at the end of pit road the first name to tick off jamie winslow in the number four dkr engineering car at the front of the pack graham yeah and valdemar ericsson follows through the number five for rlm sports ryan Harper, excuse me Harper Ellum is aboard the number seven from nielsen racing team virage Oh, no, they're not out there yet. Into your applause. Kayaski is aboard the number 13 car. 15 from RLR is Gael Julien. Over the first five to take to the track. Let's see who is next. It is the 31 for Racing Spirit Number 1. Antoine Ducan. I uh, was delighted, by the way, I popped into uh, the Sport Models shop at Le Mans, device on the Kamai, with the ledge collection. And uh, who should serve me behind the counter but Antoine Ducan. No. Oh, indeed. Brilliant. It was indeed Manuel Espirito Santo in the number eight Team Virage car. The number 11 for your international is Adam Ali. And who else have we got here? Marcus Sibet, the number 17. We talked about him just a little while ago. Matteo Lahey will take the 35 ultimate car. That means two to call. Glenn Van Berlo in the number 10. And we wait to see who's going to be out there in the WTM by Rinaldi Racing number seven car. Sorry, number 12 car. That car remains on pit road for the moment, the second of the Duquesnes. So there have been some tweaks regarding the uh, previous qualifying drivers at to Barcelona. So James Winslow wasn't plugged in in Spain. It was Pedro Perino instead. And that change that you mentioned about Kai Aski, the wheel of this car, the 13 green and yellow into Europol competition car, rather than his teammate, uh, Wyatt Brikacek, the American, so British driver instead. They also have Miguel Cristoval of Portugal in the lineup. Looks like that car's going to come straight back into pit road, Indeed. though. So they may be doing the diagonal switch on the tyres to make sure that uh, they heat up in the short time allowable of only 15 minutes. So you put your rear left on your front right and the right, right rear goes front left, and that way you heat up the tyres more readily uh, we being a rear-wheel drive car, what you're struggling for is front tyre grip. And you really do not want a car understeering around this place because there are several hard stops and tight corners as well. There's also the Mistral straight, which is so long, it actually allows the tyre temp to cool off a little bit as the car is going at something like, uh, well, in this category, 200 and... What have we had through the split already? 260 kph, and that's even just on, a, on an outlap. Yeah, 266 is the peak number. And that is for Oscar Tunia, the W10 by Ronaldi Duquesne. So Jamie Winslow making use of that clear air in front. I'm sure, given the choice, you'd want to slip straight down the Mistral and then every other bit of the lap to be as clear as possible, but you don't have that option. Unless, of course, you're able to pick somebody off into senior corner and then jump ahead of that car into the final sector, ensuring that it's open road all the way to the line. But there'd need to be an awful lot of luck involved if that would be to be the case. Valdemar Eriksson for RLRM Sports, labelled as fifth fastest, but pay no attention to the graphics and the current positions they will all mean a lot more next time around so beginning to get up to speed now not that long before we start to see the first of these cars come through to set a flying lap first one through will be james winslow in the dkr engineering number four he has the number five of our m sport car with valdemar ericsson in his wheel tracks here comes winslow Time to match or better is 1.54.029. So that is the time to go for. Ericsson some little way off that at the moment. He slowed dramatically in the final sector. I think he felt he was too close to Winslow yeah. and wanted to just buy back a bit of that time. I thought there was a problem actually for the five, but see that quite often in qualifying, just easing out the throttle at the end of the lap to make sure that the start-finish straight is clear again. Nielsen Racing's number seven car goes through. The hands of Ryan Harper-Ellum. He takes the provisional pole, 153-2. So 
So eight tenths up on James Winslow's best. The number seven, Ligier, goes, uh, goes, uh, goes through and into the lead of this session. Ten and a half minutes to go. Glenn von Berlo for Euro International, now heading out of the double right-hander at Bose. Turn 11 and 12 into Virage du Lac, named after the lake, just the, the camera side of the track, and Virage du Pont, which is the bridge, if you know your French, uh, where, where the track goes over one of the internal roads to gain access to the paddock. Uh, to complete another lap. So Ryan Harper Ellen now the new name at the top of the shop with car seven for Nielsen Racing. 0.8 of a second clear of the early pace setter Jamie Winslow. Yeah, Jamie Winslow though is a lot quicker on this lap and I think is about to take provisional pole back. But Ryan Harper Ellen not hanging around either. Neither is Marcus Siebert. This is going to start to change and change quickly at the top of this time again scoring screen. Number four in the hands of James Winslow, coming through turn 13 now towards the end of this lap. Ryan Harper Ellen goes purple through sector two. Glenn Van Berla going quickly as well. So 153.2 is the mark to beat. It's a 152.8 for James Winslow. Almost four tenths up on the best of Ryan Harper Ellen. Up into third, Valdemar Eriksson. Mathieu LaHaye coming through shortly and is currently in fourth position. Harpella goes back to the top though and back with a bang. That was one heck of a final sector. He's eight and a half tenths up. Antoine Ducard gets a lap deleted because of track limits and this might have been the moment or is this a Glenn von Burlow spin? No, it's Ducan going sideways. So not only does he lose a heck of a lot of time, but he's also been done for track limits. Understandably, I suppose, but that was never going to be a quick one. And uh, the first sector took him 43 seconds rather than the usual 32. Yeah, Gail Julien, by the way, up into second place now briefly for RLRM Sport before that position is taken by Marcus Siebert. Seven Nielsen Racing, 17 Cool Racing, 15 RRM Sport, the four DKR Engineering car, and then the eight from Team Virage are the top five right now. But Glenn Van Berlo rewrites that, goes top, and goes top by just shy of three tenths of a second. 151.687 is the new mark to beat. That's from the 21 year old Dutchman who was working so hard at the end of that previous lap to achieve a provisional pole. See soaring at the wheel there through Virage du Lac, the penultimate corner, but then pinpoint straight coming out of turn 14 and over the line. Found most of the time actually in the first sector with an absolute best there. Oscar Tugno goes over the line to fourth. go fourth and helping him along the way, an absolute best middle sector. So Tugno, who I thought was not putting the car straight away, number he 12. Was, you know, he, he was, he was there from the start. We, we did spot him in the car. So the Colombian, 27 years old, from Cali, uh, is on to the second row, joining Marcus Siebert, pole sitter in Barcelona. Yeah, so Glenn Van Berlo from Ryan harper Ellen, 0.278 of a second. Harpelin comes through and halves that gap, 0.136 of a second now. Marcus Siebert, third. Oscar Tugno, fourth. Gail Julien, fifth. Jamie Winslow, who was top of the times, now down to sixth. Ryan harper Ellen then getting the gap down to just a tenth and a bit now. Antoine Ducan looking to rectify matters after that earlier spin down at Virage du L'Hôtel. Now heading across the, uh, the start-finish line for Antoine Ducan. He will move up to seventh position for Racing Spirit of Lumin. Good lap underway at the moment for Ross Coutinho. It's not bad from uh, Ryan Arprella, but he's got more work to do here to get on to terms with Glenn Van Berlo. Full power for Antoine Ducan, the 5.6-litre Nissan normally aspirated V8, sounding glorious in the Le Castellet sunshine. And just skating his way there through the left-hander was, the, was the Virage man. It's a further improvement from pole, official pole setter Glenn Van Berlo. And uh, new mark beat now, 151.617, the gap to Ryan Harper goes up over two tenths again. Oscar Tugno goes third. Again, with a ultimately fastest middle sector. So, pretty clear, the Duquesne, very good. 
down the Mistral Straits indeed. Glenn von Burlow's just on a 32.5 in sector one. That's not even showing as a personal best, let alone a purple sector time. However, on the split, he's destined for perhaps an improvement on the 151.6 that he's already posted. He's been very, very quick indeed for the third sector in this session. We're coming to the five minute mark to go. Oh. And he's a tenth and a half up. Ryan Harper Ellum gets within 22 thousandths of a second of Von Burlow's effort now. So the Nielsen racing car number seven is really flying. You can't get many cigarette papers between those two cars if they were circulating absolutely as one. And Marcus Siebert running in fourth now for Cool Racing, the number 17 car. Here he is into the final corner. Again, up through the first couple of splits. Oscar Tuño's just pulled off an absolute best in the middle sector. And Espirito Santo goes briefly third, but he's jumped to that position by Marcus Siebert for Cool Racing. Absolutely. Looks to me like Oscar Tuño. If he can keep in clear air, is on for a leap up the order here from, he's currently fifth, but on pace to take the provisional pole away. Look and see, he's got traffic. So too did Glenn Van Berlo. So this could be costly for Oscar Tinho. See what he can produce at the end of this lap. He's got the 13 car right in front of him. Is this going to hold him up? Well, we'll soon see his best of 151.956, three tenths off. What is this going to be? He goes to the top. Yeah. He goes to the top by two tenths of a second. It's a 151.411. I didn't think Kayaski was going to be a problem. He was far enough ahead in the inter europe competition number 13. So Colombian driver Oscar Tunio on course at the moment for a first pole of this season for WTM. In the Duquesne, there's only two Duquesnes in the LMP3 entry for ELMS this year. So this will be some statement from those running the M30 DO8. Yep. Meanwhile... Harpella to the top. Wow, here we go. Oh, where did that come from? Middle, well, no, rather first and third sectors, a 48.9 in the final sector, nine thousandths now the margin between Harper Ellum and Oscar Tunia. And Glenn von Burlow's not done yet because he's going faster through the first sector than he's managed all session long. We've got three minutes left, so the Dutchman should get to the end of this lap and, well, maybe two more by the end of it. Currently got five drivers, four drivers now on uh, schedule to beat the provisional pole setter. So Harper Allen improves in his first sector. Oscar Tunio is half a second up on that pace. And Glenn Van Berlo two tenths up. It looks at the moment to be a battle between these three. Glenn Van Berlo goes back to the top. 76 thousandths to the good. So 85 thousandths of a second separates the top three here, Johnny. It is a 151.326 for Van Berlo. Plays the 151.402 for Harper Ellum and the 151.411 for Tigno. Predominantly, these driver lineups are made up of silvers and bronzes, and uh, there is no limitation to which driver you use. But I'm surprised at how much pace is continuing to be gained all the way through the session. We're still seeing blue and purple sector times for absolute best, including from the provisional pole sitter, Glenn von Berlo, who's gone quicker than he's managed all session through sector one. Ryan Harper Ellen for Nielsen Racing, still second fastest. Who just crossed the line because there was some movement Marcus there? Siebert. Siebert is back up to in fifth. fifth. Jamie Winslow's just crossed the line for DKR Engineering as well. And Jamie finding improvement, 152.039. Next car to arrive will be uh, Gael Julien for RLR M Sport, number 15, currently 10th. He's gone up into, into sixth. It's an improvement for Ryan Harper Ellum. 23 thousandths is now the gap. So he's cut that gap but not enough. What can Glenn Van Berlo do? It is one more minute to go before the chequered flag is shown. The driver's currently fourth and fifth about to cross the line. Espirito Santo did improve. Marcus Siebert did not, though. And I say Espirito Santo improved, the Portuguese. Well, he did on time, but not in his fourth place position. Glenn Van Berlo due across the line any time now. Fastest at the moment. Can he extend the gap? It's a 151.3 currently. 
and he doesn't improve upon that, but still 23 thousandths of a second, a mammoth margin over Ryan harper Ellen. not at all. 12 car, 24 seconds to the chequered flag. I think it may get through here for another crack, and it may not need it. He's almost two tenths up, having set no fastest sectors for himself. He's just putting together a neat, tidy lap. He will get one more shot. Will he need it? Third place for Oscar Tunio at the moment. He improves his time. He stays third. 151.392. It is 66 thousandths of a second between first and third. Incredible. And a quarter, uh, rather a third of that difference, pretty much. First to second, just 23 thousandths. Oscar Tunio, though, is closing the gap. Kayaski's leapt up to fourth position yes. for Inter Europe on competition. Three personal best sector times on that lap alone for the young Brit. Uh, he's on a tear. Starting to get cars crossing the line with the chequered flag. DK Engineering's James Winslow topped the session, remember? Well, no, no better than eighth. Ryan Harper Allen pits and will do no better than second. Oscar Tunio is on a quick lap here, though. Could he spring a surprise? He's about a tenth of a second down on pole position pace here after sector one, but we know that that Duquesne is very quick in sector two. And indeed, he's three tenths up yeah. after sector two, having not even set the fastest sector for his car. Ryan Harper, Ellen into the pit, so we're not going to see any improvement now for the Nielsen Racing number seven car. Glenn von Burlo, a chance to improve, but I don't think he's going to. Will he need to? Well, really, they're going to be looking over their shoulder at Euro International to the Oscar Tunio driven WTM by uh, Rinaldi racing car. And Tunio, a little way away from the line just yet, he's just working his way through turn 12. He doesn't have uh, traffic either. Van Berlo takes the checkered flag, he's got no improvement. So, so it's all about Oscar Tunio. What can he do? Is this going to leapfrog this car from third? Up the order. 66 thousandths he needed to find. He goes pole. He goes pole by 59 thousandths to a second. Oscar Tunio, the number 12 WTM by Rinaldi Racing Car, 151.267. Pole for the team for himself and for Duquesne. And what you didn't see there in vision was a camera that we had in the Euro International garage and the mechanics were on tenter hooks there and then a few of them threw down their gloves because they knew they'd missed out on pole position with Glenn von Burlow by 59 thousandths of a second. That's how much it matters up and down the pit lane with so many different stories. Of course, there are going to be 11 teams that are, or 11 cars that are disappointed and one that comes out on top and it's the Duquesne of WTM by Rinaldi Racing. It is under a tenth of a second for the top three. It is under half a second for the top seven. It is under a second for the top 11. Very, very close indeed. Terrific stuff to watch as well. And we talk about the LMP3 session often going the distance. Well, it went all the way to the wire there on the final possible lap for Oscar Tunio. He pulled off the 151.267 to give him pole position and usurp Glenn von Berlo and the number 10 Euro International Ligier. Number seven, Nielsen Racing, also a Ligier for Ryan Harper. Ellen will finish third fastest ahead of Kayaski for Inter Europol competition. Team Virage, fellow Polish squad, two Inter Europol finish fifth fastest ahead of Cool Racing. RLR M Sport seventh, DKR Engineering is uh, eighth, and then Ultimate and the second Euro International car, ninth and tenth, ahead of Racing Spirit of Liman and RLR M Sport for Antoine Ducan and Valdemar Eriksson. I learnt a little nugget of uh, information about Lima, which I always thought was a misspelling of Le Mans, but actually the the uh, local name of Lake Geneva, if you live in that area, is Lac Le Mans. With, oh, really? With the accent on the E. Well, and, it, and it is perfectly spelled, in fact. And you look at where Racing Spirit of Le Mans are based, and it's just south of Lake Geneva. Well, spot on. I never knew that one. Neither there you go, I. ladies and gentlemen. With thanks to Stephen Kilby, your colleague at uh, Daily Sports Car, who is a whiz when it comes to uh, the odd Google moment, shall we say. So, a chance to catch up after a frenetic LMP3 session with the victorious team and teammate to Oscar Tunio. 
I am with Torsten Kratz, driver of the number 12 WTM by Rinaldi Racing. Congratulations, your teammates just put it on pole. I'm sure the spirits are high in the garage. We've seen all the mechanics and you've got a smile on your face as well. Yeah, of course, thank you. It's, uh, yeah, Oscar did an incredible job. So uh, he was also in the, in the second last lap. He was quite fast, got some traffic. And then he put everything together in the very in the very last lap, and I mean six hundredths of, of a second, unbelievable. So um, yeah, he put us in a in a good position for tomorrow. Now we have to bring it home tomorrow. Yes, and you got incredible qualifying pace as we've seen. It was very close. How's that going to translate into your race pace? Ah, we will see. This is quite exciting. So no one, I think, no one knows really what's going on tomorrow with this four-hour race. Um, yeah, so we have to maintain the, 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 the tires, we have to be gentle to the tires, uh, so the first stint will be a very long one, I guess. And, um, but I think we, have, we found a setup during the free practice, uh, which will keep us on speed during the time. So. All right, well, best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Torsten Kratz, who will be very swift indeed when he takes to the driving stint in the number 12 WTM car, sharing with Leo Weiss, a driver he knows very well from racing Ferraris with WTM uh, around the Nordschleife and other places too. But Oscar Tugno is a, clearly a very good fit into the German team, hailing from Colombia and uh, new to the European Le Mans series, but certainly making his mark as we t now turn our attention to the bigger prototypes, and this is the first of two LMP2 sessions, again, each for 15 minutes, but a big field of Pro-Am lineup of LMP2 cars this year. All must contain one bronze, and then you, I think, a maximum of a gold and a platinum then to join the bronze along the way. New colours for Nielsen Racing, the third livery of the year. Just say hello to Shadow, the uh, LMP2 Husky there. It's uh, the late lamented doggy friend of Rodrigo Salas. United Autosports, one of three LMP2 cars in this field, two of which are in the LMP2 Pro-Am stakes. They're familiar dark blue, red and white, for the Anglo-American squad. Jim McGuire joined by um, Andy Merrick and, sorry, by uh, Guy Smith and Paul Diresta. Diresta. It and is, of course, the bronze drivers that we'll take to the track for this session. Yep. And uh, that is a difference again between LMP2 Prime qualifying and LMP2 proper qualifying, where you can use any of your drivers. So, again, another look at this uh, really good looking blue livery on the Nielsen car. Follows on from there. Gold livery to start with the same basic color design and then the tribute livery at Le Mans. The 83 car from AF Corsa. Francois Perodo, it will be to take this car to the track. And there's, you know, we, we see throughout sports car racing these jewels, you know, in the FI World Endurance Championship in qualifying, it's lately been uh, Ben Keating and Sarah Bovey. Here, well, Sally Yollock. Franz Barbarodo, and anybody else want to join the fight? I suspect they probably will. There's a long list of them, no doubt about it. And uh, yeah, this is a great place to make your mark in that case. Sally Yollock was uh, the winner in qualifying, if you like, at Barcelona all those weeks ago, taking pole position for the number 34 crew, racing Team Turkey. But then it was a momentous victory in the end for a Pro-Am lineup to take the win outright. Uh, we had a whole load of cars uh, finishing on the lead lap, seven of them in total because of late sa or latest safety cars, mid-race safety cars, we might better call them, and some full-course yellows as well. But yes, uh, the driving in the closing stages from Louis Delatraz, something really to savour. And the middle stint from Charlie Eastwood in Barcelona was very good too. But it was all really down. The foundations were built by the Turkish driver Sally Yolic as the bronze in that lineup, uh, extending the gap from some silvers at the time. Yep. yep. It, uh, it was a topsy turvy race, wasn't it, at uh, Barcelona? Helped by some early safety car yep. uh, action, without a doubt, that certainly helped one or two of the prime cars to stay in the overall hunt. But uh, some pace, a little bit of messiness as well in the early laps of that uh, Barcelona race. They'll be looking for a cleaner run this time as we wait for LMP2 Pro-Am to go green. 
So the drivers are already pre-described, if you like, as I say, the, the maximum you can have outside of the bronze driver is a gold and platinum combination, unlike in the World Endurance Championship LMP2, where it can be two platinums joining a silver driver. But this is now the only place you can go pro-am racing in LMP2. And the European Le Mans series will retain LMP2 Correct. in 2024, unlike the World Endurance Championship. So LMP2 Pro, uh, LMP2 and LMP2 Pro are set to continue. And that also means, of course, that unlike uh, has been reported elsewhere, I'm afraid, that LMP2 will continue at Le Mans. There will be at least 15 cars at the Le Mans 24 hours in 2024, uh, with a variety of cars earning their places through success in the Continental Championships and through the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship and the remainder being selected by the ACO Selection Committee. Out they go, Johnny. And I think that's going to be great because you're not only going to have to pay attention to the World Endurance Championship, but when you go to Le Mans, you really need some knowledge of ELMS and IMSA and the Asian Le Mans series to know who those the teams form. are and also, yeah, who's likely to take the win. Absolutely. The form book is going to be all over the place, isn't it? Uh, Asia Le Mans series, of course, going back to Southeast Asia for half its season at the end of this year. Two races in Sepang, followed by three races in the UAE, one in Dubai and two in the Asperina. So an expansion from four to five races in three different circuits. And the key is going to be who is going to make that trip in the LMP3, in the LMP stakes. It needs to be six cars in LMP2 but to count for the auto entry. OK, so that's something to bear in mind as well, although possibly not this early on in the season. If you're still in the fight, maybe going into oh, Spa. Yeah. Uh, and then the double header. I mean, that's massive points paying now at Portimao. Normally, you'd go into the final round thinking 26 on the table, but it'll actually be 52 in this peculiar season. There's always been some sort of a tweak in the LMS. I uh, mentioned last year, Hungara Ring didn't run, so we had two rounds at Monza. This time, the night race at Aragon was always part of the plan. Uh, but uh, certainly not going to Imola but was uh, was not within the confines of this championship, at least when the calendar first came out last year. So who's out there? These 11 cars, identical Oracle 07s on the Goodyear tyres, remember. Tom Van Rompuy is in the number three decar engineering car. This is the car that took the win for the Asian Le Mans series uh, this year. And it is a very old Oracle indeed. Chassis number five from 2017 is that car. Team Virage, and the number 19 is at the hands of Alexander Machel. Fred Pordat is aboard the number 20 from Alcar Pro Racing. Then we have the, 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 the two LMP2 Pro-Am cars from United Autosports USA. Daniel Schneider is aboard the 21. Jim McGuire in the 23. 24 from Nielsen Racing, Rodrigo Gonzalez. And Sully Yolok, as we said earlier, in the 34 Racing Team Turkey car. 37th cool racing car is in the hands of Alexander Poigny. And it is Ulrich Edmund in the Dragon Speed USA uh, 81 car. F Quarters 83 in the hands of Francois Perodo. And completing the field, the 99 Proton Competition car is Giorgio Roda. And very difficult to know which way this is going to go because similar to the GTE bronze only session, I think times are going to tumble all the way through. And that means three back to back sessions where. You're going to have to stay till the very end, 12 minutes or more in fact time, depending on who can sneak the extra lap in, as in cross the start finish line with a second to go. And uh, it may end up being a, something like a 17 or 18 minute session Absolutely. instead. But uh, yeah, the bronzes will find time. They'll get more confident. The quicker you go in these aero uh, efficient cars, the more the car is glued to the track and then the times really start to come. And it is about the confidence that these guys can build aboard these cars. Giorgio Roda, I expect to be well up there. Sally Yolich, I expect to be up there. Uh, Francois Perodo, certainly too. I expect to be there and thereabouts. And there will be others emerging as they get more and more confident with the more seat time they get. That's the thing to remember, Johnny, is some of the, the drivers that have not that much time aboard these cars will not have been well served by there just being one race before them on. 148.781 is the mark to beat. That comes from the 99 Proton Competition car for Giorgio Roda. Yeah, we did have Pro-Am cars, of course, at Le Mans, but it was very much a subcategory, wasn't it? So uh, in Hyperpole, for instance, 
you could put whichever driver you wanted into a, a Pro-Am car. The Platinum could do the time, potentially, rather than that very special way that GTE Am was run this year uh, at Le Mans with uh, an open all to get your car into the top eight, and then the bronzes have to do the hyperpole session on the Friday. Now, Giorgio Roder, as you say, setting the pace, 1.8 seconds clear of Fred Pordad with Sally Yolich, who took Pro-Am pole at Barcelona. He's sitting there just in wait in third position in the cherry red racing team turkey car. And this is, I think, part of the, the way in which Shelly Yolick is learning his trade. He's not going all guns blazing in the early part of the session. He's building up his pace. Giorgio Roda had a much improved pace for this lap. He's on with 10 minutes to go. Looks to be sub 148 for him. Shelly Yolich is, if anything, on a better pace still. So keep an eye on those two cars, looking for where Francois Perodo is about to complete his first flying lap. I don't think he's up to kind of pole position pace quite yet. Roda goes through in a... That's not him going through, my apologies. That's another improvement. That is... Perodo goes third. So it's Roda, Pordat, Perodo, Yolik at the moment. Times now to come. Giorgio Roda goes through. It is a, 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 the 47s. Well into the 47s. A 147-168, no less. At the moment, 3.4 seconds clear. But with other drivers improving and improving rapidly. Sonny Yolik goes to the top by 37 thousandths of a second. So it's a 147-131. Plays a 147-168. That's how close we expect it to be. Tremendous stuff. Giorgio Roda, if you're unfamiliar with that name, comes from a real good racing stock. Older brother Andrea, uh, Gianluca, their dad races, and even Uncle Davide Roda uh, can be seen behind the wheel of a racing car as Racing Team Turkey are now fastest. In fact, we just saw Gianluca Roda standing next to Jimmy Bruni oh, in the Proton Garage. Uh, he's been here all weekend. Charlie Yolok going quicker again this time, and a lot quicker. Four tenths up on his previous pace in Sector 1 alone. Tom van Rompuy right there as well. He's up on the current provisional pole time, but not quite as quick as uh, Sally Yolix at this point. Francois Perodo, a little bit wayward coming out of turn 11 there. Plenty of the car up and over the kerb. But into Virage du Lac, much more control. Sitting on the left-hand side of the circuit and looking way ahead of the apex there, just peering over before turning to locate where he wants to put the car in a couple of seconds' time. And then nice and wide as he goes over the grid hatchings. Perodo will stay third, but does improve his time down to a 147.9. So it's a 147.1, plays a 147.1, plays a 147.9, top three. You say stay third, he had dropped back to about eighth position before. Oh, OK. Uh, but we're about to see Giorgio Roda goes through. He improves 147.008.123 of a second ahead now, Sonny Jolic. But Jolic is going to beat that time if he's got a clear run through sector three. And he does, and he does by eight tenths of a second. It's uh, the low 147s becomes the low 146s. And that all of a sudden becomes a much tougher to beat. Seven minutes to go into the second half of the session. Sully Yolich in the 34 Racing Team Turkey car. 146-178. Eight tenths of a second clear. Giorgio Roda in the 99 Proton Competition car. Tom Van Lomboy stays third. He's about for three tenths off uh, Giorgio Roda in the number three team car engineering car. Then Alexander Matchell in the team garage car. Then Francois Perodo. All of those cars under 148. But the gap between those four, uh, those five cars, 1.8 seconds. So big gaps here. Alexander Matchell together with Tom Von Rompuy get the better of Francois Perodo. That's a nice little dice for effectively third on the grid. So going the way of the Belgian at the moment. But Matchell of Germany racing with Team Virage, the Polish team. Uh, in fourth position and back ahead of Francois Perodo. Henrik Hedman, born in Sweden but based in Florida and now running with the US flag uh, for a very American team, Dragon Speed USA. So back into the European Le Mans series, we welcome Henrik Hedman and he's now arriving at to senior corner. 
having just dropped down to eighth place, so gaining some ground. Rodrigo Salas now sixth fastest, Daniel Schneider seventh quickest. Fred Bordad, who was initially setting the pace down in ninth, but there is still some time left to try and find a better lap. Yeah, Henry Hedman, uh, before we got into LMP2 programme, the only man to win a race overall as a bronze-rated bronze driver of the LMS. That uh, feat was matched in the FI World Endurance Championship by Racing Team Nederland. But, uh, this is the man that made history as a bronze-rated driver. And where is he going to end up here? Started that lap eighth. He stays eighth with an improved time. So looking to hit the brakes as late as he dares into the Verary S. Yes, the number 81 numbered car in eighth position, as you can tell from the graphics tower to the left of your picture. Sally Yolich leading the pace by eight tenths of a second over Giorgio Roda. Rodrigo Sales in the Nielsen racing car about to cross the line. He should improve. Better lap. Yeah, Goes fourth. Fourth. That's yeah. a good lap for Rodrigo Sales. 1.5 seconds off Sally Yolich, he may be, but that was a much, much better time. An improvement in all three sectors. That boats well. Moving forward, four and a half minutes to go. Yolik to Roda, Van Rompuy, Sales, Alexander Machel, and Francois Perodo. He's also improving at the moment. Giorgio Roda had his last lap time deleted for track limits, but it wasn't anything special in actual fact. It's still about the same distance. It would have been if that had existed still. 147.8, yeah. so the gap's eight tenths. Perodo up to fifth, but still 1.7 seconds off. Pole. Disappointed with that, I'm sure. Alexandre Quani for Cool Racing, 37 going quicker, 148.7 in seventh position. Another lap deleted for this time the number 19 car for Alexander Machel for Team Virage. So that's part way round. Oh, he's had a big off because that's a 56 yes, second yeah. first sector, which is way more. So a spin either at turns one or three, I would guess. And that's the reason why that time has been deleted, it was turn four in fact, I know exactly where the spin was. Meanwhile, Racing Team Turkey and Sally Yolic working through the gears. 4.2 litre, normally aspirated Gibson engine working hard in conjunction with the extract gearbox that all of these cars are fitted with. Alexandre Kwani, seventh fastest now, heading through senior corner. Yeah, just 60 of those engines in circulation, leased from Gibson Engineering in the UK. And whenever we finally say goodbye to these things, we're going to say goodbye with a fond farewell because it's been the soundtrack to international sports car racing since 2017. So rounding Virage du Lac will be Alexandre Quani, keeping an eye peeled on Francois Perodo, though, as well, for Perodo. his AF Corsa car. Perodo could improve and improve quite a substantial chunk here. So, it does indeed. He goes up to fourth. That's Rodrigo Sales. But he's still just under 1.3 seconds off. Nothing appears to be going to get in the way of Sally Yolich here on his way to pole position. Jim McGuire chiselling away at his best effort so far as well, just done a personal best through the first sector. The national flag of Belgium demonstrated nicely on this DKR engineering car, but because of Tom von Rompuy being from that part of the world, so the red and the gold and the black represented on this Luxembourgish run car, he was third. Stays third. Uh, no improvement there. Sally Yolich has pitted. I think that's their session done. I'm not sure that Giorgio Rodo has got any response to this. Well, with limited amount of tyres in the uh, LMP3, uh, LMP2 part of the order, you don't want to be burning through too many sets of good years prior to the race because your tyre allocation straddles not only four hours of racing tomorrow, but also this qualifying session. And it's unlike GTE, where you can just keep throwing rubber at the cars. You want to try and preserve some good sets of good year for later on in the weekend. 31.429 in sector one for the Proton car. That is about two tenths down on the pole position time. And it's a similar gap in sector two as Rodriguez Salas comes through and goes third. 
That's a much better time for the Salas. That's two places up, 147, 307. They get one more crack at this. We're into the final minute. Provisional pole setters, Racing Team Turkey and Sally Yelic are on pit lane. Don't think we're going to see an improvement in position here. There might be an improvement in lap time from Proton Competition. Now, the 99 will come through with time to do one more lap. As you said, Johnny, you know, wiggle as he leaves the final turn. It's all about tyres at this stage. Yeah. Well, you only get 12 individual tyres for the whole uh, of qualifying and the race. So three sets for a long four-hour race where you're going to be doing probably about six stints if it stays green. Yeah, no improvement in time either from Giorgio Roda. I'm sure that squirrely moment in the exit of the final turn would have paid a part in that. But it's a good, a good uh, performance from Proton Competition. Their first year, remember, in LMP2. This program alongside their hypercar and soon to be GTP efforts. WC and the IMSA Weather Tech Sports Car Championship. Alongside, of course, GTE efforts. And this year as well, another new effort for them in Porsche Carrera Cup Deutschland. Spreading their wings. Yeah. Alex Onkwani, this could be his best lap of the session. He's in the final part of it now. Daniel Schneider's also up through the middle sector, but these really are for positions probably seventh and downwards, with Sally Yolich so confident that the 146.1 will be good enough because he occupies the absolute best first sector, second sector, third sector. He's parked that car with nobody really able to get too close. Rodrigo Salas does find a better time, though. He did, yep. Two, two tenths down on second place. That's a great qualifying performance from Rodrigo. It really is in the number 24 Nielsen racing car. Rodrigo, much more experienced in GTE machinery, although has done some prototype racing in the last few years. Francois Perodo will stay in fifth position. Improves his time, but stays in fifth. You're quite right, Johnny. Just waiting for Tom Van Rompuy to come through. And also Giorgio Roda, but uh, Roda definitely not on uh, challenging here for uh, an improvement in position. He completes the lap by pitting. Tom Van Rompuy. Well, where is that car? It's just about across the line now. Yeah, does so now in the pits, in, in fact. Pits. So that's why it take, took uh, Tom a little bit longer so for clearly, DKR engineering. Clearly, as Sector 3 did not do all he wished it would. So, Sally Yolich, it is an MP2 Pro Am pole position here at Paul Record, Johnny. Just as it was in Barcelona, and by a decent chunk of time as well. Eight tenths of a second for the Istanbul Istanbul born driver. So 34 Racing Team Turkey ahead of the Proton Competition number 99 for Giorgio Roda, uh, eight tenths of a second shy. The 24 Nielsen Racing run for Rodrigo Sales, mightily impressive to bag a second row star alongside Tom Van Rompuy, the final car to enter the pit lane for DKR Engineering. Third row will be AF Corsa and Team Virage for Francois Perodo and Alexander Matchell. Alexandre Quani for Cool ahead of Henrik Hedman for Dragon Speed USA. The United Autosports USA entry of Daniel Schneider finishes ninth fastest ahead of Fred Pordad for Algarve Pro Racing. And in 11th position, Jim Maguire in the United Autosports, the second car from the Wakefield based team, number 23. So. Uh, and by the way, if you thought that was it, no, there's more LMP2 action to come. They were your 11 LMP2 Pro Am efforts, as you'll see, Samuel, in with the TS Sport crew. Look after Racing Team Turkey. We've got another seven LMP2s in the overall LMP2 class still to come. And the Racing Team Turkey car now being rushed to post session. Scrutineering, no doubt the Weybridge and a few other post session checks as well, because it is the pole sitter. They may well pull random cars from further down the order as well. Uh, but uh, the 34 car will be checked out. And then later on, we'll get a confirmed grid, uh, confirmed qualifying session result turned into a grid for tomorrow. Yeah, correctly taking their time. It's a nasty little turn there around uh, the back of the pit lane. That's one of the Michelin Le Mans Cup GT cars found out to their cost earlier. Very high kerb as well, which rather uh, squashed the front end of that Ferrari. Let's catch up with our pole sitter now with Steph Wentworth.
I am with Sally Olic, who has just put it on pole position again. You did it in Barcelona, and you've done it for the second time. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a nice session. The track has been, you know, the slowest stuff all weekend, which is a bit of a shame because, you know, in the quality you want to, you know, really push and take the maximum maximum out of the car and go fast, but it wasn't the case in the quality in terms of the lap times. But yeah, I'm happy got the pole position and, you know, starting the front tomorrow. And you were so confident that you were going to be on pole, but you came into the pits before the session even finished. Did you think there was any more pace in the car or did you know that was as fast as you could go for the session? No, probably as fast as I could go. Like we wanted to save the tires for the race. Uh, so there was no need to push for another lap at that point. So that's why. And you won in Barcelona. You're going for another overall victory this weekend? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. We will try. All right. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think he may need a little bit of luck along the way because it was partly to do with how the Barcelona yep. race panned out with the odd safety car here and there. However, he also had to drive like crazy and, you know, he is quite clearly one of the standout bronze drivers in, in this, this year's entry. He most certainly is and growing in confidence and growing in awareness of what he's going to do there. Andy Lofthouse, the TF Sport photographer, just making sure he gets suited back up and Gets a shot with the branding. That's uh, the important part of what keeps the commercial part of these together. We, though, can shift our attention, Johnny, to the seven cars in the LMP2 class. And, uh, well, this will be entertaining as well. United Autosports USA, Algar Pro Racing, Edex Sport, Duquesne Team, Inter Europol Competition, Cool Racing and Panis Racing about to do battle. And for me, one of the real standout and surprises from the Barcelona weekend as a whole was the fact that we had people like Neil Jarni and Jot van Aerter and Jonathan Aberdeen in that session, but it was Richard de Geras yes. in the 47 car, recently moved up to gold from silver for cool racing that took pole position by only 39 thousandths of a second. But that was sort of the making of a man all of a sudden. Richard de Geras had previously raced with Duquesne yep. as their silver driver um i didn't realize you know he was off that sort of caliber of driver You'd the 20 year old very long odds on that being the pole position taker and good luck to him it's fabulous totally. to see the you know the the form book turned upside down and all that means is everybody out there will know there's a new contender and everybody turns it up to 11 that's what you want to see in a uh, a qualifying session great to see crowd still watching on from the Relative cool and shade of the balconies above the pit uh, pit garages. This was the, the winner last time out, by the way, in LMP2 at Barcelona, albeit second overall yeah. to Racing Team Turkey, uh, an LMP2 program team taking the win in Barcelona. What have they got this time? And, and you know, the more you look, Johnny, at the, the names up and down the entry list in this European Le Mans series this year, it is truly world-class. It is an absolutely amazing entry. Just looking through very quickly, James Allen, who won an LMP2 on the line in the Rolex 24 last year. Paul Luc Chatan won the fastest in the LMP2 anywhere in the world. Uh, Job Van Uter, and not still a coming man in uh, LMP2. Oli Jarvis, Alex Lynn, Lawrence Herr, another of the new stars around. Neil Jarni, Le Mans winner and WEC world champion. Oli Caldwell, uh, from the Alpine uh, team in the WC. Jose Maria Lopez, Pachito Lopez, Toyota Kazoo Racing, races with us this year. And on and on it goes. Nelson Piquet Jr. Uh, from Formula One, of course. Jack Hawksworth, Lexus factory driver in IMSA Racing. Paul De Resta with Formula One form, of course. Matthias Besch, Louis Delatraz, Nico Lapierre. Juan Pablo Montoya, Ben Barnico, Jimmy Bruni, and on and on it goes. It's an astonishing lineup. Yep. I don't think we've ever seen a lineup in LMP2 of that quality. I, got, I think that's probably right. I mean, I'd have to delve back into the entry lists, but uh, I mean, there were so many names when this entry list first came out at the start of 2023, and you thought, have I actually picked up the ELMS entry here, or have it inadvertently landed yes. on the WEC page? But uh, no, I mean, so impressive, and hopefully a sign of things to come for the future of this sport, because you won't be able to race LMP2s in many other places, well, certainly not the World Endurance Championship, moving into next year. I, I'm hoping that lollipop sign that said 30 kill was to do with the engine and not an instruction to be out there on track. But uh, this is going to be a little bit like... An, uh, it's an automotive duel, isn't it? 
it's just a seven way duel with uh, people swinging maces and God knows what else out there. But it's all about how quickly can you get this package, this Orica 07 package with that Gibson engine, with an extract gearbox, and which, with whichever star you've put in your reasonably priced car to get around this, uh, this Paul Ricard circuit. I love it more than words can say. It's been great entertainment at uh, the LMS in this, this current era. And long may this continue with whatever they decide to replace these cars with in a couple of years' time. Just the one dry weather, as it's stated in the regulations, that's a slick to you and me, uh, available compound from Goodyear Ten, in this nine, category. So eight, no qualifying seven, tire as such. Six, you have to use one five, set or two sets four, of your race three, tire for tomorrow. Two, one. Pit exit is open for LMP2 qualifying. Please remind drivers of the need to respect the white line at pit exit and the track limits during the whole session. Seven cars. Uh, on a trip home as they continue around the circuit, almost to the point at the scene corner, closest point in the track to Orica's factory where all of these cars were built. And we're now over 110 of these chassis now delivered to teams around the world. An extraordinary endurance racing car. Already some trading of road position as the 28 car ducks underneath there, that, that being driven by Paul Loup Chatat. Is Ollie Jarvis in the number 22 United Order Sports car? Alex Lynn driving the Algarve Pro Racing 25. Chata, as mentioned, in the 28. Ollie Caldwell piloting the 43. Jose Maria Lopez in the 47. So we're not going to get a repeat of the Richard de Guerras pole position. Uh, Manuel M Maldonado, who was busy at the Nürburgring Nordschleife last weekend on Saturday. Not necessarily. Uh, not necessarily, no. But I wanted to get this fact in. Oh, I can't Sorry, go, go now. Fanatic. I've spoilt it. <laughs> Manuel Maldonado, who was at the wheel of a, a, Hun a Hyundai i20 little hot hatch uh, during, he? during the NLS 5 race, the 6 Was hour. he really? Yeah, and I thought... Is that definitely? And it was. It was Manuel Maldonado uh, way down again in the entry list. He'll be doing his ring permit and looking for opportunities next year. Why He's not? indeed going to be gone for new tets in, yes. uh, in that car. Here's my fun fact. Ron Hinton's dad is racing here this weekend for the first time in seven years in the Midget Midgets. And uh, that'll be, I'm sure, for interesting conversations over dinner tonight. The final drive, by the way, Rennie Binder is in the Duquesne team, number 30 car. That's uh, Artur van Outert, I believe. Yes, it is. And um, Lovely does, guy. Doesn't his brother, i.e. Yop's uncle, also perhaps race as well from time to time? There's definitely, there's a big family of oh, racing yeah. there. Uh, and Yop van Outert is the latest product of it. But we've known about him Look, since he was winning LMP3 championships stopped. with RLR. I think that was just a note. Oh, no, track. there's a car no, stopped on 22. track. Beg your pardon. It is Ollie Jarvis in trouble. So that's strange, because we don't often see an issue, especially this early on in a session, from an LMP2 car. We had, if you were tuned to the Ligier European Series, a difficulty for one of the LR Motorsport cars in the much earlier race this morning, where that kept stopping. But we may be left with little option here but to stop the session in order to clear Jarvis's car. The other flags at the moment, is that going to be enough? Well, it depends whether he can get it restarted. Indeed. And uh, if that recycle doesn't take too long, if the session has to be stopped for Jarvis's stranded car, that will be him out of the session entirely Completely with right. no time qualified. And I have to remember back whether that will probably mean the start at the back of the LMP2s rather than completely the back of the grid. In WEC, you start behind everybody. But um, I'll have to check on the regulations where potentially a, a stopped car will have to start tomorrow's race. He is still stationary at turn 13 and now gets it running. Come on, Ollie, come on. If he gets it back to the pits, then that's fine. And at the moment, that can the slow car, very, very slow car, can just be signalled with white flags. Clearly got an intent to work its way back to the pits and then to the sanctuary of the team at United Order Sports. They have a much better chance of solving the issue. Meanwhile, the session continues. First flying lap posted by Paul Luke Chatat, and it's a 151.0, but he had to be very wary of the very slow Oli Jarvis car. Indeed, he did. Keep an eye on the 22. It is, was a lap, of course. And uh, 
Ollie is just about at the pit lane entry. On pit lane for the number 25 car. Terribly slow, though. Yeah. And he's stopping again. Well, he, is he now way off the track? With mechanics trying to get to the far end of the pit lane, the but problem is United are about two thirds of the way down it. He stopped, and I don't think he's managed the bloodline either. So they will only be able to, they will only be able to attend to the car. It's a red flag, and that's because the pit lane ex uh, entry is blocked. So Ollie Jarvis did his best to get there, but the mechanics won't be able to help until he's crossed the white line at the start of pit lane. So. United Autosports have a horrible start to this qualifying session. There is a line at about where the blend line begins, but that's known as safety car line one, and there's no chance that mechanics will be allowed to run out onto the track there to push the car. The marshals can, but now, are oh, you right, it's right at the start of pit lane entry, but because Ollie Jarvis and the number 22 United car is the cause of the red flag, that now eliminates him from running any more in this session. Yeah, so the... Excellent little quad bike intervention vehicles here that you'll see coming in as immediate tow vehicles in circumstances like this. We'll get this sorted very quickly. But uh, the, the, the victims here of this are going to be tyre management. This tyre management would have been a key part of this. And the teams that were looking to manage the way these tyres were blended into this session that's all going to be spoiled, and we've effectively got a 10-minute session now, not a 15-minute session. Indeed. And if you're on a hot lap, oh, well, we've only got one flying lap posted from poor Luke Chatan, but anybody else pushing hard before the red flag came out has now started to burn through that set of tyres and completely pointlessly. Uh, only you learn that in retrospect, of course, but it, you're going to have to lean on probably another set of good years to get the performance required. And I would suggest that the third set, you only get three sets for the race and qualifying combined. The third set will be kept away, yep. not even approaching qualifying and kept for the really important money stints in the closing stages of tomorrow's race. So the sorry sight of Ollie Jarvis's car now being moved on the back of the quad bike strop. Yep. And there'll be a few United perhaps having a bit of a strop because of this, because everything will have been checked. You know, they're working their way up there. Free practice too earlier this morning for 90 minutes, where presumably the car ran OK. And then final checks between the end of that session and qualifying, but nothing will have left been have left to chance. So quite what has happened there, they'll be scratching their heads. And until they see the car, they won't be provided any answers. No. So rotten luck for Ollie Jarvis and for United Autosports. That uh, leads to six cars in this order. And uh, still the red flags, the, the clock is not counting down, but that's a quick change of tyres for the still Delage liveried Edex Sport car. The Edex Sport team carrying this livery on for, uh, through from uh, Le Mans this year. Delage, another historic make. And uh, back into the automotive business with their road slash track going hypercar. Green flag immediately comes. Yeah, so Edex normal livery, the red and the black with a bit of white on it, yep. but adopting the blue and white, which uh, is very fetching indeed with the Edex branding on top. And that car then will now head back into the session. Who was at the front of the queue? The 47 of Jose Maria Lopez. So Pachito with a clear road in front of him now for cool racing. And there's a fight breaking out behind, a race, in fact, between Duquesne and the chasing car of Cool. Uh, no, it won't be Cool because it's ahead. But anyway, Duquesne very, getting very close to Pachito on the brakes there. The number 30 car of Rene Binder. It's going by, in fact. So Rene Binder's gone to the front of the queue. Was it Binder that did the first bit of the yes. session? Yes, Rather it was. than Johnny. Yeah. OK. They probably thought René's got more to learn through the course of the session rather than Neil Johnny, who essentially knows it all already. It's the 25 car, is the, I think, the next car in the order, so that's Alex Lynn. So, at the moment on track, we have Paul Luc Chatin with the Edex Sport car, the only car to have set a flying lap before the Red Flags came up. Oh, John is out of the session. Alex Lynn, Cadillac factory driver, is in the Algar Pro number 25. René Binder in the Duquesne team car that won last time out in class. Ollie Caldwell in the Tiropol's car. Uh, 
driver from the Alpine Elf Endurance team, Jose Maria Lopez. What a career he's had in touring cars and sports cars in the last decade. And then Jop van Etet in the number 65 Panis Racing car. Which of those names is going to be the pole position sitter after the next eight and a half minutes? So, fastest, but only by virtue of the fact that it's the car that's set to time and everybody else has not, Paul Luc Chatin. And he is not quite at the back of the field. He's now managed to get by Jot von Outer to Panis on this outlap. But the quick laps begin now in earnest for René Binder's Duquesne Orica, together with Paul Luc Chatin, Alex Lynn for Algarve Pro Racing. Ollie Caldwell and John van Outen. Well, the one car we're missing, of course, Oliver Jarvis' is number 22 United Autosports car after it ground to a halt on what was probably a flying lap. No, yeah. It was out lap, I think. Was it his out lap? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. So um, even worse for United Autosports. Not that really breaking down on a flying lap helps that much uh, because it's still the same end result. No time recorded and not permitted to continue on. Still labelled a stop down on the circuit, even though it is now back in the pit lane. So now we start to get down to what the kind of uh, lap times we might be able to see are. Oh, so a quick shot there of Louis Delatraz with the LMB2 Pro-Am racing to Turkey. Paul sitting garage. Did Louis in the paddock a little earlier? Gossip about uh, happenings around the, the world of sports car racing. Always good to catch up with him. So Alex Lynn and Rennie Bender pushing and pushing hard right now. Well, Lynn's comfortably faster than anybody else through the middle sector by a couple of tenths. Jose Maria Lopez has backed off actually or made a mistake somewhere because he's a couple of seconds down on the Alex Lynn middle sector right now. I think he got himself involved in cars that wanted to go to the front and again as you said a little earlier the broadcast has realised discretion better part of valor drop back a bit give yourself some space and then go for it. We we'll start to see some quick times now though. Rennie Binder goes to the top 146.427 Alex Lynn 147 so we had a Poor third sector, Rennie yeah. Bender it is in the 30 Duquesne team car that goes to the top. So 146.427 is now the mark, and that's with six minutes to go. Pachito over the line for Cool Racing in the 47 car, doing a 156.7 in the process, but he was definitely warming things up in the closing sector to make sure his exit out of Virage Dupont was respectable. Another quick first sector, another purple sector from Rennie Binder. Could this be a glory day for him? Or are we going to see some of the perhaps better known names in this list? There's the wonderful sound of the Duquesne car as now uh, Pichito's made a mistake in the cool racing car down at Virage de l'Hotel. So straight lining turn three and having to take to the prescribed escape road not jutting back off that uh, exterior route and instead looping round turn four and five and rejoining safely on the other side. But that's burned another lap. Remember, we're losing time hand over fist here yeah. after the session was red flagged with just about five minutes on the clock. We were left with 10 minutes and change. But you've got to take an out lap out of that before you've even started the flyers. Yeah, on these laps at the moment, Alex Lynn looking like he's going to make a major improvement. Jan van Utrecht the same. And Paul Luc Chatin, the same. So three potential new provisional pole sitters, depending on what happens in the final sector of this lap. First across the line, it's going to be the Algar Pro racing car of Alex Lynn. He goes top, it's a 145, 417, two tenths the good. There's still punches to be swung here. Burst of the throttle there from the, well, there's the 28 car. That was the Algarve Pro Racing car working its way through the very, very S at the start of the lap. Binder so, goes through. He's improved his time. But four tenths of a second. Job for Nuta. It is to go to the top. And then Paul of Chatan immediately. 144.7. So Edict Sport from Panis Racing, Algarve Pro Racing, Duquesne and into Europol are the cars that have lapped at pace. 1.1 seconds the gap between all of them. 
Went through the second though to the good. Paul Luc Chatin from Jean Fonditer. Down through the box for Paul Luc Chatin into the hotel corner. Now careful not to take too much curb through turn four because you want to then take the natural racing line into five and then you're turning right very quickly after that as well through six and it's all about the exit speed out of turn six through the kink at seven which will determine your top speed down the Mistral straight so conducive to a good lap time looking out for middle sector times Paul Luke Chatat is up on everybody else through sector one but it's a good effort from Ollie Caldwell at 27.7, and even faster than that, Jot van Outer in the Paris Racing 65, currently second. But faster than both of them is Paul Luc Chatan in defence of his provisional pole position. This is going to be very tight indeed. We're dealing in tens, not thousands at the moment, but that's close enough. Jot van Utet, 145.012. 0.309 of a second down on Paul Lip Chatan. He's up on that time and up on the time of Chatan at the moment. But Chatan too is improving on his own time as they both work their way through this final sector. Here comes Jean Fanutet. He'll have the first opportunity to. Uh, to, to what happened there? Oli Colwell goes second. Vanutet goes top. But Paul Lip Chatan expected across the line. He and goes top. Now. There he is, two thousandths of a second quicker than Jot van Aerten. I was about to say, with all the years that Paul Luc Chatan has run in the European Le Mans series and the fact that he's from Dordain, there's got to be a bit of local knowledge here to just unlock those odd tenths, I was going to say. It's actually two thousandths of a second. As good as Jot van Aerten and Ollie Caldwell and Pachito and Alex Lin are, Paul Luc Chatan has been racing here for years and he's with a team he knows very, very well in Egypt. We've got Ollie Colwell goes through, uh, sets a purple first sector. Jot van Utrecht follows that with slightly better. Jose Maria Lopez then goes quicker still. He's a tenth up on the other two guys. It's not quite as quick in sector one this time from Paul of Chatan. It's going to be about the rest of the lap though. Colwell right there. Although well, not quite as quick as Jot van Utrecht. We're dealing in one hundredths. A great middle sector again from Paul Shatter. Luke Shatter. Absolute best by, well, we were thinking about, you know, 100th here, 100th there. He's just blasted down the Mistral, two full tenths, faster than everybody else he's competing with. This could be very, very close. It looks at the moment as if Paul Luke Shatter has got this field covered. But it's, for me, all about those top four or five cars. Brenny Binder, after shining brightly, doesn't seem to have an answer at the moment to this pace. Shatter up on his own time, but not by much. Next across the line will be Ollie Caldwell in the colours of Inter-Europol competition, but he's lost a bit of ground. That is a good time. Joffen out to provisionally to pole, but here comes Pachito. Paul Luc Chatin can't match that, so he's lost a bag load of time in the final sector, it's whereas the Argentine did a 45-7 in the final sector. Fabulous third sector from Pachito Lopez. Cool racing to the top of the times. It's 144, 253, quarter of a second clear of Paul Luc Chatin. Yep. Paul 